Mm. Oops, yes. it started. Today we have some friends. This is, who is this? That's Foxy. This is Foxy. And who's this one? Suma. Suma. Yeah. So, so we have yeah. Foxy and Suma joining us today. So, um, yeah, so we're going to, um, oh, no. no, no, just leave it on the table. It's okay. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, guys. So, Father, we just thank you. Lord, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for this fellowship. That even though we are separate and apart from each other, Lord, we can still come into your presence. Lord, we can still be in you. Lord, you are so good to us. And Lord, I'm just so thankful for all that you have for us. In Yeshua's precious name. Amen. So, uh, last week we, we took a walk through uh, the resurrection. And uh, we're go this week we're going to go back to 1 Peter. Uh, in, a, in a week or so, I'll probably, as we get a little closer to Shavuot and Pentecost, we're definitely going to talk a little bit more about that. So uh, you can look forward to that in a, in a week or so. Um, before I get started, I, I do want to wish everybody a happy Anzac Day. And um, for those of you who, on the, you, it was also this last week, we had Yom HaShoah, so Holocaust Remembrance Day. And then on, I think it's either Monday or Tuesday, Tuesday our time is Yom HaZichron, which is, um, which is the Memorial Day for Israel as well, similar to Anzac Day. So it happens that they're both in the same same time period of the of the year of the calendar. And then Wednesday is Independence Day for Israel. That's right. And then Wednesday would be Independence Day for Israel. So if you know any Israelis, uh, tell them Happy Independence Day and uh, Happy Yom Hazikaron. So let's all turn in the Word to First Peter. We're still in chapter one. We're starting at verse twenty-two. First Peter, <clears throat> so um, as, as you're turning there, uh, we remember that Peter, of course, is the author, he's the apostle, he's the disciple of Yeshua, the Talmud, the Talmud who, who followed him, and, and the Lord really did a work in Peter's life. He really changed Peter's life, and... Um, he became known as the Apostle to the Jews. And we, we talked before about how this letter and Second Peter, they're both written primarily to uh, Messianic Jews uh, throughout the provinces of Asia, Asia Minor, what we call Turkey today. And uh, even though, of course, it was primarily to Jews, we know that there were many Gentiles who uh, were grafted in uh, to those congregations, grafted into the root and truly uh, were a part of those communities. So in, in many ways, the letter is directed straight to us, a Messianic community full of Jews and Gentiles. And we are talking currently about what it means to live in, uh, in God's grace of salvation and living in harmony. So last, last time when we went through Peter, we were actually talking about holiness and the call to holiness in our lives. This, this week, we go from holiness and start to talk about living in harmony with one another. So let's go straight to the word. First Peter chapter 1, verse 22. Now that you have been purified, your souls in obedience to the truth, leading to sincere brotherly love, love one another fervently from a pure heart. You have been born again. Not from perishable seed, but from imperishable, through the living word of God. For all humanity is like grass, and all its glory like a wildflower. The grass withers and the flower falls off, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word that was proclaimed as good news to you. So get rid of all malice and all deceit, and hypocrisy and envy, and all Lashon Hala, as newborn babes, long for pure spiritual milk, so that you may grow towards salvation, now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. And we will, we will pause right there. So living in harmony. Once we've, we've talked of holiness, we've talked about how we are called to live a holy life 
to live righteously before God. Uh, we are called to be holy as He is holy. Now let's look closely at verse 22. It says in the complete Jewish Bible, it says, Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth, so that you have a sincere love for your brothers, love each other deeply with all your heart. When we obey the truth, it results in a purified life. It, it, is, the, it is the outflow of, of, of obeying what God has commanded. Psalm 119 verse 9 says, How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. Psalm 119 verse 9. And so we keep our lives pure by, by guarding our lives according to the word of God. There's a good quote here uh, from an R.M. Raymer, and he says, Just as going through trials and sufferings refines our faith, so obedience to God's word refines our character. Obedience to God's word refines our character. You see, obedience is it's not an option for disciples. It is actually the very definition of a disciple. The Talmudim, the, the Talmud, they would follow their, their master. They would... They would literally live in the, the, the dust of them, the, the, the one that they were following. You know, as Yeshua is walking down the road, they'd be constantly right there. You'd see Yeshua in the front, but then this group of 12 guys just right there, living in the shadow and in the dust of the one that they were following. You see, an obedience, that's what defines a disciple. Remember when Yeshua talked, to, we, we've talked about the hard teaching that Yeshua gave. Uh, about, you know, eat my flesh, drink my blood. And he, he was calling them to a deep discipleship. And then he turns to the twelve, because everybody else seems to have left. And he turns to the, to the twelve and says, will you leave also? And Peter, Peter was the one who spoke up. He says, but you have the words of eternal life. Where would we go? Where would we go? And I think that's, that's the heart that Peter has, even in this, and he's writing them. It's like, even if we don't fully understand what Yeshua is saying to us, or we don't fully understand how he's going to do it, our response needs to be like Peter's. Yours are the words of eternal life. We're going to follow you because we have come to trust you and know that you are the Messiah, the Holy One of God. When we follow Yeshua, the evidence of that is our love for one another. By this, people will know that you are my disciples, because you love one another. We see that in the book of John. But here we see we've gone from, from holiness, and now there's this call to love one another. A call to love one another with, with sincere love. The word for sincerity can also be translated without hypocrisy. It is a sincere love, a true love. It has no hypocrisy. Peter uses two different wor words for love in verse 22. He starts out by saying, you know, because of your, because you've purified your souls in obedience to the truth, it has led to a sincere brotherly love. We know that brotherly love is the phileo love, the Philadelphia brotherly love. But then he gives the command, he says, therefore, love one another fervently from a pure heart. And that love is agape. Agape has been come to known as divine love or godly love because it's the only love that God refers to of himself in the New Testament. But agape, what does agape mean? Agape is a, no, a strong non-sexual affection and a love for the person and, their, and for their good as understood by God's moral character. And it is especially characterized by a willingness to forfeit your rights or privileges on another person's behalf. Agape is the love of caring. It's the love when you care for somebody, even if you don't like them very much. 
it's a love that's actually demonstrated in, in Anzac Day in, in the sense that the nurses demonstrate agape love. They care for people that they don't know. They reach out to somebody and do what is best for that person, even if the person is saying, no, stop it, that hurts. The nurse does what is best for that person. They care for them. They love them. <laughs> I'm just hearing an echo of myself. Hopefully you can hear me as well. So we are called to emulate the love that God has demonstrated to us. In this way, God loved the whole world, that he gave his only begotten son. And whosoever would believe on him would not perish, but have eternal life. You see, God saw the need for the world was the sinfulness of our hearts. And therefore he provided salvation. He provided a way of escape. He provided a solution to the problem of sin and death. He provided his son, the Messiah, Yeshua. And this is that love because God loved us in such a way that he demonstrated his love to us long before we ever demonstrated any of our love to him. The love that we are called to express is to be expressed deeply. This means at full stretch or in an all out manner with an intense strain. The love that we are supposed to express to one another as a body of Messiah is the very love that Yeshua demonstrated to his time of He says, I have loved you, love each other as I have loved you. We have a great role model, a great person to follow. He's demonstrated his love for us. Let's go on to verse 23. Verse 23, it says this, You have been born again, not from some seed that will decay, but from one that cannot decay, through the living word of God that lasts forever. We have been born again, born anew. To be born again, it's, you know, when Nicodemus came in John chapter 3, he says, how can a person be born again? Do I have to enter into my mother's womb? Yeshua says, unless you are born of the Spirit and of water, you will never see the kingdom of God. And there is this call for us to be born again, born spiritually, into the fullness of what God has called us to. Basically, what Kepha is reminding us is this, that whatever we do in obedience to the Word of God will last forever. But whatever we do, in the energy of the flesh, it will look beautiful for a time, but then it will die. I just remember a, um, a sermon that David Wilkerson gave, and he talks about the anguish. He says the prayer of anguish, and he was birthing something in anguish. And he says that there were so many things, and this was near the close to when he, uh, before he passed on. He says there are so many things that he had done. And they were just, they might have been good things, but they ended up just being the work of the flesh. It was just good and it just did not bear lasting fruit. But he says the things that were birthed in anguish, the things that, where the, the, the heart of God and the, 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 just the pain and the, 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 the desires of the Lord, what God is longing for, when that drives us to a place, where we are compelled to obey. He says, those are the things that produced long-lasting fruit. And that's exactly what Peter is saying here. Our being born again was paid for by the anguish of our Savior, Yeshua, the Messiah. And the things that we are called to do, in many cases, I would say most cases, they must be born from a place of anguish, a place of wrestling, a place of crying out to the Lord, a place of, of asking God, what are you saying to me now? Those are the things 
that will have eternal fruit. Peter then goes on and, and quotes from Isaiah. And he says, For all humanity is like grass, and its glory is like the wild flowers. The grass withers and the flower falls off, but the word of Adonai lasts forever. Moreover, this word is the good news which has been proclaimed to you. His, his use of the Tanakh in this place emphasizes the fact that he's talking to a Jewish audience. He's talking to people who understand the scriptures, who know the scriptures. He's expecting us to know that he's quoting from Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 40. And these words in Isaiah 40 start with comfort. Comfort my people. It's really in, in many cases when you look through the, read through the, the book of Isaiah. You get to chapter 40 and it's like the whole, whole feeling of the book changes. Something happened at that point in Isaiah's life where all of a sudden the revelations that he started getting were about the Messiah coming. They were about the, the plan that God had for the future and the hope for Israel. The future and hope, that the, the plans that he had for Israel. I'm not exactly sure what Isaiah saw in chapter 40. But I can tell you that these words of comfort, they remind us of the futility of the, of the now. But they also remind us of eternal glory. They remind us of the eternal things. What really matters in the end. When we get to heaven, what, what are those things that will burn off like wood and hay and stubble? And what are those things when burnt will be refined like gold and silver and precious stones? What will remain of the things that we have done? What were the things that we did simply because they were a good thing to do? And what were the things that we did because they were God's thing for us to do? This is what these verses are talking of. You know, at the end of that verse, it says, Moreover, the word is the good news which has been proclaimed to you. How does the word of God come to us? How does God speak to us? You know, I've found that God has spoken to me in a variety of different ways. He speaks to us first through Yeshua the Messiah. He is the living word made flesh. If you want to see God's heart, go read I would say the red letters. If, for those of you who know, go read the words that Yeshua spoke. You want to see the heart that, that, that God has for people? Go read what Yeshua said. We also see it through the scriptures because we know that the word of the Lord lasts forever. The word of Adonai lasts forever. You know, God is not bound by our words. We can say something and it may or may not be right. But I tell you, when God says something, He fulfills it. He completes what He says He is going to do. We also hear God's Word through the proclamation, the declaration, the proclaiming of the good news. When, when someone teaches you from the Word of God, when, when you hear the Word of God, you know, one of my hearts for the congregation is that you also would be teaching one another from the Word. It's good that you want to listen and hear me as I expound some of the Scriptures. And I'm, and I'm thankful for that, and I know that it's necessary to, for us to come together as a congregation. But it's not enough to eat once a week. You must be feeding yourself and your family more often. You need to be reading the Word of God. You need to be talking with your children, talking with one another, praying with one another. That's an area that even I see that I can grow in, is that I need to pray more. I need to seek God more with my family, with my wife. Do I worship God with my wife? Do I spend time reading the Word and discussing it with my children? You see, we have been born again. And we are now called to live differently. 
We are not going, we, we do not live the same life that we had before. We are called to a newness of life. And this is where I know that you know that the chapters and verses were put in much later. Peter didn't actually put in the, the chapter, which is why in the complete Jewish Bible, it starts out by saying, therefore. And uh, I had a great preacher once tell me, if you ever see a therefore, you need to find out what it is there for. He's, it's a conjunction. He's saying, based upon what I've just said, let's talk about something else. Rid yourselves of all malice, of all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, all of these ways that are, that are speaking against people. And become like newborn babies, thirsty for the pure milk of the word, so that by it you may grow up into deliverance. For you have tasted that Adonai is good. So firstly... Therefore, based upon having this call to holiness and this call to love one another, we are called to therefore rid ourselves, to put off, to lay aside, to cast away, to divest ourselves of everything, of these specifically these five different areas. Now, it's interesting that the five different areas of sin that he mentions all have to do with interactions with one another. They're all sins that are committed against somebody else, between you and somebody else. Some of them can just be in your heart, and some of them can be actively against somebody else. But they all deal with relationships. The first one is malice. Malice is a wicked ill will towards somebody. That's where you wish something bad on somebody. Now, I know that as a body of believers, we, we understand that, okay, yes, I shouldn't wish ill will on my brothers and sisters. But that's one of the reasons why I want to be also so slow to bring judgment against another pastor that says something that I might disagree with. We're seeing so many little clips of sermons and little different things here and there all over the place. And there are things that I absolutely do disagree with. There are things that I disagree with, but I want to be so slow before I bring an accusation against a person until I've heard them fully out. I do not wish them ill, even in the cases of disagreement. And you know, this is something that as we get into political seasons, we need to hold as believers, some, this, we have to hold this, that even though we have a political disagreement with someone, we must not Wish them ill. Do not wish for anyone to go to hell. Do not wish for anyone to suffer judgment. I pray for the people around me. I pray for people's salvation. I do not wish for any to taste that judgment. I want them to experience the forgiveness that I've experienced. I want them to experience that sort of life. The next is deceit. Deceit is a deliberate dishonest, dishonesty. It's lying or deliberately concealing the truth from someone when it could benefit them. We also mentioned hypocrisy. Hypocrisy, uh, it is a pretend piety or love. It, hypocrite was the Greek word for actor. It means to pretend, to act. You've got a mask. You know, you have a, a mask on. You're pretending to play a different character. You know, the word integrity is the opposite of that. Integrity comes from the word in, or integer. Our word integer comes from the same root as the word integrity. It means oneness. It means that you're the same person regardless of who you meet with, regardless of who you are with. Number four is envy. That is a resentful discontent. You see, I've, I've talked about the difference between envy and, and jealousy. Envy always has that resentful side to it. It is always resentful of a person for what they have, for the wife they have, for the, the spouse, the, for, the, for the car, for the house that they have. It goes right into the 10th commandment, you shall not covet. 
Number five is slander. Slander. And, you know, slander, I use the word Lashon Hara in the, in the um, Tree of Life version. Lashon Hara is directly translated the evil tongue. And it is a derogatory speech about another person. It is the sharing of rumors, of gossip. Sharing bad stories about somebody else. Deliberately to make the other person look bad. Instead, what are we called to? Let's, let's throw these things aside. And what are we called to be? Well, we are called to be like newborn babies. Well, what are newborn babies are like? Newborn babies are vulnerable. They are vulnerable for, you know, nine months in the womb and nine months out of the womb. They are so vulnerable. Everything, they are so dependent upon their mother. They are helpless. They can't do anything for themselves. They can't change the nappies. They can't feed themselves. They can't, they can't do anything. They don't even know that it's time to go to bed sometimes. And they're hungry. All the time hungry. For, for those of you mothers who breastfeed, I know. It's like this two hour on the dot. You don't miss it. They don't miss it. Trust me, you do not miss that two hour feeding. And it doesn't matter if it's the middle of the night. or It doesn't matter. But they are hungry. You know... These attributes really reflect the, the, the things that we should have in our lives. You see, the pure milk of the word is what nourishes us. And we are to crave the unadulterated spiritual milk of the world. Of the word, sorry, of the word. The spiritual milk of the world. And, and man, I keep saying world. My word. Apologies. The word. The spiritual milk of the word. And uh, for those of you who are, who are lactose-free, it's okay. This will not cause an adverse reaction. You know, it is sad when believers have no appetite for the Word of God. We are called to grow and to crave God's Word. But instead, we see a lot of craving after religious entertainment. And that's not what we're called to. We are called to crave the meat of the Word. We are called to grow from, from babes into adults. And we are called to go from the milk of the word into the meat of the word. And to really, to have things that are chewing. And, and this is demonstrated through discipleship. Going from the, the milk of the word to the meat of the word is demonstrated by obedience. Obedience to what God has called us to do. When we are properly fed spiritually, then we grow up into mature, mature believers. And our own our salvation, our own, our own understanding of the love that God has for us, of, of the heart that He has, also grows. You know, the scripture says that anyone who desires to be a bishop desires a good thing. Anyone who desires to be a servant leader or a shamashim desires a good thing. You know, it is a, it's a great thing to be able to serve others. Because I will guarantee you that it's not like the rest of the world. When you are in a position of authority in the world, you are the man or the woman in power and in charge. No, it's not like that. Yeshua demonstrated. He says, when you... A mature, if you want to lead, then you will lead by serving everyone. You lead by cleaning toilets. You lead by sweeping floors. You lead by, by, by being willing to do and, and love and, and, and lay yourself thin for other people. God does not want us to be spoon fed. I mean, I understand that, look, I love and enjoy preaching. I enjoy that. That's a, it's a gifting. I understand that. And not everybody is called to that. And don't, don't hear me say that. But it's not enough for you to simply hear my words. It's not enough to simply be fed by me. I want you all to be in your word, in the scriptures. Eat the scriptures. Treat it, like, treat it like a meal. One of the habits that I've gotten into that, that I really recommend is that whenever you eat a meal, 
also eat some of the word of God. Use it as an opportunity so that you never, you never forget to eat your breakfast. So then read some word of God when you eat your breakfast. Just remember to chew on the word of God and to truly follow after him. I want to close with a, with a scripture from the book of Hebrews. I'm going to go to Hebrews chapter 5. It's just a couple pages before Peter. Hebrews chapter 5. And we'll start at verse 12. Actually, I'll start at verse 11. Hebrews chapter 5. Now about this subject, there is much for us to say. And it is hard to explain, since you have, been, you have become sluggish in hearing. For although you ought to be teachers by this time, again you need someone to teach you the basic Basic sayings of God. For you have come to need milk and not solid food. For anyone living on milk is inexperienced. And the teaching about righteousness. He is an infant. But solid food is for the mature. Who through practice have their senses trained to discern both good and evil. As we mature, maturity comes with, it comes with experience. We know that, we know that in a practical sense. But maturity does not just come from going through experiences. It comes from making godly decisions in those experiences. This is why you have some believers who, who've been believers for 30, 40, 50 years, but are still newborn in their faith because although they have gone through many experiences they have not responded in the way that Yeshua would respond they have not laid down their life as Yeshua laid down his life notice it says here but solid food is for the mature who through practice have their senses trained to discern both good and evil Discernment is learned. Discernment is learned through practicing God's Word. Practicing the things that God commanded us to do. Yeshua said this, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Discernment comes from obeying God in spite of the costs, in spite of the circumstances. It comes from doing what the Word of God says, regardless of what other people think. As mature believers, we are to eat solid food, the Word of God. His Word is good. The psalmist writes this in Psalm 119, verse 103. He says, How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through your precepts, I get understanding. Therefore, I hate every false way. And in verse 3, Peter again quotes from Psalm chapter 34, verse 9. And he says, Taste and see that Adonai is good. How blessed are those who take refuge in him. You see, the Lord is good. As we walk out our lives... With the Lord, we come to trust Him. We come to know that in His hand is every provision that we need. In Him is the place of security. In Him is the place of fulfillment. In Him is the place of true um, growth, of eternal fruit, of things that remain. In Him is life and life more abundantly. We have tasted and seen that the Lord is good. And look, it is, uh, it's really important that we continue to do that in our lives. I'm going to, to pray, and then we'll, we'll close in the Aharonic benediction and, and continue the, uh, the Zoom meeting if there's any questions. But Father, I'm just, I'm coming before you 
And Lord, I'm asking, Lord, that we would hear your word, that we would hear you, that you would speak to us clearly. Abba, Father, we want to hear your word so that we can obey your word. And Father, if it is something that you've already told us and we have not yet done it, I pray that you would remind us again. Remind us of those milestones that we may have forgotten. Take us back, Lord, to the place where you spoke to us last, so that we remember the last thing that you said, and so that we can obey. So that we can, Lord, obey. Lord, and, and demonstrate that, that, that we love you. Lord, demonstrate our love for you through that obedience. Lord, we are your servants. Lord, we are called to go wherever you call us. Lord, we are called to do what you have put before us, whatever that might be. And regardless of what that costs, we know that it is worth it eternally. In Yeshua's precious name, I'm going to close with the Aharonic benediction. We'll close off the, the live stream and then continue the Zoom. Yevarech Adonai Vayishmarecha Yaheh Adonai Panav Lecha Vechunecha Yehisa Adonai Panav Lecha Vesem Lecha Shalom The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. In the name of Yeshua, our Messiah. Amen. Shabbat Shalom. May you all be blessed. Amen. Amen. I'm going to just... Uh...